what's all the fuss over p-values? Some of you uh, may have heard over um, recent uh, months uh, of a, a statement published by the American Statistical Association on uh, significance testing and p-values. Don't worry if you haven't heard it. This is a recurring uh, theme that, as I'll point out shortly, about every 15 years or so, give or take plus or minus two or three years, there's a groundswell of complaints about the um, uh, usefulness of significance testing and the p-value. What I'd like to uh, say today is that there's nothing wrong with the p-value. If you use p-values, continue using them, it's perfectly fine. But, um, uh, uh, or before the but, I, I, I want to say it is a time-honored and useful statistical tool as far as it goes. The problem is many statisticians have argued for many years that it doesn't go far enough. So what does that mean and what should we do about it? In a nutshell, the p-value answers one, but only one question about research hypotheses. If you ignore this last point, which we'll flesh out momentarily, and you fail to remember that a significant p-value, p less than 0.05, is not the uh, end of a statistical analysis, but only the beginning of a comprehensive statistical analysis. If you think that the holy grail is to get p less than 0.05 and publish and get your ticket to Stockholm, you're going to fall into uh, sad traps, logical traps, and serious traps as well. One particular um, illustration of this is that we tend to think of the p-value as a measure of the weight of evidence against the null hypothesis. And the statisticians I've alluded to have demonstrated time and time again, and I'll give you some examples today, that the p-value is a flawed measure of the weight of statistical evidence. That's an important point, and um, one that uh, I want to spend some time discussing. A disclaimer, everything I'm about to say is not new. Um, the story begins in 1925 with Sir Ronald Aylmer Fisher, the father of modern statistics, who published an influential book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers. In 1925, he introduced the concept of hypothesis testing or significance testing as it's called. Fisher was a um, statistician working at the Rothamsted Agricultural Field Station and was concerned about um, drawing inferences about whether uh, certain fertilizers or certain conditions for growing agricultural crops would do better for the yield or not. He introduced not only the uh, notion of hypothesis testing, but as well the notion of randomization and its use in experimental design to get high quality inferences. How those inferences get drawn and what question those inferences are addressed to answer, and what we believe about the results of the experiment vis-a-vis -vis our hypotheses, that's where the subtlety and the nuance lives. And so the take-home message for today is going to be nothing wrong with p-values, but let's not be silly and let's not be short-sighted about how we take the information, p less than 0.05 or p greater than 
or be equal to 0.05, and what we do with that. Already in 1938, a famous paper by Bergson raised some philosophical issues with the approach that Fisher took in testing null hypotheses. And uh, uh, it was 13 years after the publication of the first edition of Statistical Methods for Research Workers. So, as I said, roughly every 15 years or so, people are um, scratching their heads and saying, wait a second, some, something isn't quite complete here. 1947, um, are people familiar with the Merriam-Webster time traveler tool? You put in a number and they'll tell you the year it first appeared in published print as far as the editors of the dictionary know. So uh, exactly 70 years ago, the p-value, although it may have been spoken about, it actually appeared as an object in print. Oh, about 15 years after that, um, statisticians and clinician uh, Steve Goodman and Richard Royal from Johns Hopkins uh, published a very nice article. I highly commend you uh, to take a look at it because uh, they asked the very same questions I'll be posing today um, and have a very well-balanced and easily accessible story to tell. This isn't 15 years later, it's sort of in between the next 15 years, but another extremely entertaining um, presentation by Jack Cohen uh, in 1994, published in The American Psychologist with the provocative title, The Earth is Round, P less than 0.05. Uh, I bring this to your attention not only because um, he's a very clear writer, he was a very clear writer, um, and entertainingly so. Um, but those of you who may be familiar with his influential book on uh, power analysis in the behavioral sciences uh, might find this uh, piece surprising because Jack Cohn literally wrote the book about power. And what is power? Power is the probability you're going to get P less than 0.05 or whatever your statistical significance level is. And he first brought the attention uh, to his field of experimental psychology to uh, remind people that you don't just want to test the null hypothesis without understanding whether your experiment has a large enough sample size and has reduced um, unreliability and uncertainty and error to such an extent that you can rely on the results of the experiment as meaningful, as opposed to meaningless. Having written that and been so influential in his field, the pendulum seemed to swing so far over uh, target because people then started saying things like, we reject the null hypothesis, P less than 0.05, and then they'd stop. <laughs> they wouldn't tell you what is the effect size. They wouldn't tell you what the confidence interval was. This is an abuse, and it's not rocket science. What I'm saying is if you find a significant result, P less than 0.05, you can state it and report it, but you don't want to stop there. Then 15 years after his earlier paper, Richard Royal, uh, wrote another interesting paper called On the Probability of Observing Misleading Statistical Evidence. Because already at the turn of the present century, uh, there was a clarion call for looking at another quantity, not the p-value, but the likelihood ratio, as the appropriate measure of the weight of evidence. And Royal's point in writing this paper was uh, to say that if instead of having a criterion of P less than 0.05 and treating that as strong evidence against a null hypothesis, rather 
if we measure the weight of evidence in a different manner and we design our experiments to have strong evidence by this new measure, the probability that we will then be misled is not zero, because we can always make mistakes, but with strong evidence as measured properly, the probability we will be misled in experimental research is much smaller than it is using the p-value criterion. Finally, the statement that I began my discussion here um, was published in the American Statistician last year. It's uh, a position paper. It's uh, an American Statistical Association statement on p-values, context, process, and purpose. And um, those of you who are not familiar with the American Statistical Association, they're a very conservative bunch by and large. They don't publish position papers often. This is essentially the first um, position paper they ever published in their uh, more than 100 year history uh, in the field. So this is what caused the latest round of waves. So let's review what is the p-value. This is a quote from the ASA statement a p-value is the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data, for example, the sample mean difference between two, two compared groups, would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to read that about six times to understand what the heck they're talking about. I know what the p-value is. I've lived with it all my adult life. But the definition, and by the way, I don't consider this a particularly good definition, uh, but the definition as it is, is couched with certain phrases and caveats and assumptions. And that's where in the difficulty arises. It's also known as the attained significance level because if one were testing a given uh, hypothesis, uh, the model that is alluded to at the top of the slide, um, and if you were testing at a level of statistical significance where you would just reject the null hypothesis with your given data, that level of significance that the data attained is the p-value. So you can think of a p-value as the significance level where you would just start rejecting a null hypothesis. Let's uh, give an example. So many of you perhaps have heard of the now famous example of the lady tasting tea. The um, story uh, began uh, around 1935, shortly before 1935, in, in the late 20s actually. And um, uh, it appeared as a hypothetical uh, example in Fisher's second highly influential textbook, The Design of Experiments, uh, first published in 1935. Um, the story goes something like this. Um, a lady is at a tea party. A gentleman offers her a cup of tea. British folks, of course, always take milk in their tea. And um, the gentleman offers it to the lady, and uh, she says, no, thank you, sir. And he says, well, why not? And she said, well, I observed you put the tea in before the milk, but I always prefer the milk poured before the tea. And at which point the gentleman said, uh, well, surely, madam, you can't tell the difference. Uh, to which she responds, uh, well, surely, sir, I can. So on the spot, the statistician designs an experiment. He says, well, let's put your claim to the test. We will prepare eight cups of tea. Four of them we will prepare with milk before tea. Uh, the other four, tea before milk. We will randomize the order in which we present them to you. You know the design. 
you are at liberty to taste all eight cups and afterward make your declaration which cup uh, were prepared one way, which cup were prepared the other way. Fisher used this in his textbook to illustrate what became known as Fisher's exact test for a two by two table, uh, where all four margins of the fourfold table, I'll show you in a minute, uh, are fixed by the design of the experiment. And he goes on to talk about the p-values and the uh, sample size adequacy and so on. But reading his book, you would never guess that this was based on actually a true story, that there was actually a tea party. It was held at Rothamsted Field Station in Great Britain. Um, the lady was a real lady. Her name was Dr. Muriel Bristol. Um, the statistician was, of course, R.A. Fisher. And um, it was only much later uh, that people uh, started retelling what actually happened in the story. So I'll keep you in suspense for a moment. But here is a uh, portrayal of the cross-classification. So in the first row, the truth, the actual preparation was milk before the tea. And on the right-hand side, in the first row, you see, you see there are four cups. In the second row, the tea before the milk, four cups. In the first column uh, is what the lady says. Uh, when she says, I think this cup uh, had milk before tea, that's in the left-hand column. And when it's the other way around in her assessment, uh, it's in the right-hand column. Now, one can argue that uh, there's nothing forcing the lady to uh, determine the cups four and four, but you can easily see, since she knows that there are four cups and four cups in truth, she would necessarily have to be wrong unless she arranged her answers four and four. So without further ado, we'll assume she's going to do that in which case all four of these margins in the fourfold table are fixed by the design. Now, when you do the calculation, you can easily calculate that eight choose four, the binomial coefficient, counts the number of ways the lady could have made her assignment so as to match the four cups and four cups. But only one of those 70 ways could the lady be correct in every one of the eight cups. And clever character that Fisher was, he knew that if she made one mistake, she would necessarily have to make two mistakes. Um, because if in the upper left-hand corner there was a three, she only got three out of the four correct there, there'd be a mistake both in the neighboring row and the neighboring column. So, uh, we never knew, reading his textbook, what uh, actually happened, but the answer was she got them all right. And Fisher was so annoyed that he never wanted to uh, mention that. Uh, he had a, somewhat of an irascible character. So the p-value in this experiment would be 1 out of 70 because in... Um, the one direction where the lady is claiming she can make correct determinations, the chance would be one in 70, under the null hypothesis that she was merely guessing. So we are entitled to claim P less than 0.05. If she had made one and therefore at least two mistakes, the P value would have been bigger than about 0.25. So Fisher intuited the fact that four and four would be the minimum number of cups that he would need to put the lady's claim to a test. The uh, references I showed you earlier, uh, a delightful reportage by somebody who was actually there in the 1920s, Cyril Clark, uh, was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, and Fisher's uh, daughter, Joan Fisher Box, uh, wrote this up and uh, put the kicker in that the lady got them all right. Dr. Bristol knew her cups of tea. Uh, interesting biological, mechanical, chemical, physico-chemical question. How did she do it? 
Was it a matter of taste? Was there some thermodynamic principle that was allowing her to detect temperature differences? If any of you have any hypotheses, uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and let me know because it, it, it is an interesting question. It's a question that Fisher didn't raise because in Fisher's understanding, he was interested in testing the null hypothesis. And um, he was less concerned about the alternate hypothesis. Although, let me say more precisely, that's the rap against Fisher. These days, people say, oh, Fisherian hypothesis testing. You only talk about the null. You never think about the alternative. Well, I'm here to say, possibly in a minor defense of Fisher, that um, that's not entirely true. I'm sorry, I didn't make a slide with this. Uh, you probably can't see it, but I'll read it to you. This is another quote from the design of experiments. And Fisher wrote, in relation to the test of significance, we may say that a phenomenon is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment which will rarely fail to give us a statistically significant result. Let me repeat that. In relation to the test of significance, we may say that a phenomenon is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment which will rarely fail to give us a statistically significant result. Now, if that is not a statement of Naaman Pearson power, I don't know what is. So people who say Fisher didn't care about power are wrong because he was smarter than that. Let me go over the principles. There are six principles that the ASA statement uh, uh, discusses uh, in some greater length. And the statement itself is not long. It's about three pages long plus a two-page editorial. Um, so if you want to read these three pages, you'll really uh, have my talk um, uh, right in front of you. Principle number one is p-values can ind indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. Here's my definition. Uh, more precisely, the p-value tells you the probability that data will deviate from expectation under an assumed model in hypothetical replications of the experiment by as much or more so than they have been observed to deviate from expectation in the actual experiment. So in the lady chasing tea example, if the lady got three uh, plus three or six cups right and two cups wrong, we would have asked the question, what's the probability she would have gotten six right and two wrong, or all of them right? So that's the observed deviation from guesswork or more extreme. In the actual experiment, she got the extreme value, so uh, there was no need to accumulate further outcomes. Notice also that by definition, in the p-value, we contemplate other possible outcomes that actually didn't appear to define what we mean by the p-value. So, you know, if uh, we wanted to know if our classroom test scores are significantly better than passing grade, and we find that the mean score on an exam was 75, we ask the question, uh, what's the chance under just passing ability would students score 75 or more on average? That or more, I want to point out to you, never happened, right? They scored 75 on average, not 90 on average. So this notion requires us to imagine whether explicit or implicit, or even subconscious or unconscious, other possible outcomes of an experiment that don't occur. And that is the basis of one of the criticisms of this approach. 
So for their stated purpose, p-values are good at calculating the probability. You want to know how unlikely would a result have been under a chance hypothesis? That's what the p-value gives you. So go ahead and quote it. The model that is referred to in the definition in generality is typically what we call a null hypothesis. And Jack Cohn, in his delightful play on words, often referred to the null hypothesis as the nil hypothesis, N-I-L, to uh, catch our attention uh, at the foolishness of always framing silly hypotheses that nobody believes is true and then testing them at the 0.05 level. So the earth is round, P less than 0.05, um, it, it falls far short of what somebody in Christopher Columbus's day <laughs> would have wanted to know, like me. I would have said, oh, you think the earth isn't flat? You think it's round? Well, what's your theory? What alternative hypothesis are you uh, espousing, even before you set sail and don't fall off the edge of the earth, uh, what's your theory? And will this experiment prove your point? Principle number two, p-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. Now, this is one of the most common pitfalls among clinical colleagues and lots of people. You get a p-value less than 0.05, you immediately want to say that means something like the probability that the null hypothesis is true is less than 0.05. And I'm here to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. This is a, a logical fallacy, one of two I'll discuss this morning, this afternoon. Uh, in mathematical terms, the probability of A given B is not the same as the probability that uh, B occurs given A. Here's an entertaining example of that. Uh, in the card game of poker, if the deck is shuffled thoroughly and a fair deal is given, the probability of being dealt a royal flush, uh, an ace, king, queen, jack, ten, in all in the same suit, any one of the four suits is called a royal flush. And the probability of being dealt a royal flush in a single deal is about one in 2.6 million. So you sit down at the card table and behold, you're dealt a royal flush. Woohoo! Bet heavily. P less than 0. 0.0001. Well, actually, the P value is one in 2.6 million. Here's my question. So what's the probability that the cards were shuffled thoroughly and fairly? Is it one in 2.6 million? No. 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 The answer to that question depends on who's dealing. Listen, suppose your mother was the dealer. Let's assume that your mother is a paragon of honesty and would never stoop to uh, shuffling, uh, dealing unfairly. Reasonable assumption, right? So your mom just dealt you a royal flush. You think she was cheating? No, mom doesn't cheat. I'm, I'm certain of that. <laughs> but suppose uh, the infamous Cardinal Riario, a 14th century cardinal who was famous for holding card gambling games at his palace. He was a card sharp. So Cardinal Riario is now dealing you the royal flush. Now, what's the probability this was a fair deal? Hmm. We're somewhat less certain now, are we? My point is that the, while we can say that it's very unlikely to get a great hand like a royal flush, under the assumption, the null hypothesis of a fair deal, call that A, the probability of getting a royal flush, and call B, the assumption, the model, the hypothesis, that this was a fair deal. 
that's a very small number. However, the probability of B given A, the probability that this was a fair deal, given that I just got a royal flush, uh, that's not so clear. That depends on extrinsic factors. So don't fall into that logical fallacy. Now, an example more familiar to you would be uh, your standard lecture in epidemiology and biostatistics about the predictive value of a screening device or a diagnostic test when you're screening in a population. So you can have a screening tool or a diagnostic test that has outstandingly great sensitivity and specificity, but when you use it in a population where the prevalence of the disease you're screening for is low, what's the probability that this person who just came back positive on the test really has the disease? And the answer is it's not 99% even if your sensitivity and specificity were 99%. Here I'm spelling out some of the technical details. As sensitivity is the probability of a correct positive test outcome given the patient has the disease. Specificity is probability of a negative outcome given the patient is well, or at least without the disease. And then the positive predictive value reverses the A and the B. The positive predictive value asks the probability that this patient actually has the disease given that the test just came back positive. And negative predictive value is probability the patient doesn't have the disease given that the test came back negative. You know, I, I remember many years ago I gave a lecture to uh, the second year medical students here at PNS and uh, I went through this standard lecture and at the end of the lecture a med student raised his hand and said, but Dr. Levin, we're taught that when the test comes back positive, the patient has the disease. So what are you talking about? And I see you're shaking your head. Thank you very much. Um, if you think that the patient has a disease, if the test comes back positive, go back and, and, and read this lecture again because there are errors of omission and errors of commission. And the standard shocking result because our human ability to intuit probabilistic ideas is shockingly limited, somehow we managed to avoid the tigers without knowing the laws of probability. Um, tell us that even if the sensitivity, which is the uh, term in the numerator here, is 99%, and if the expression right beneath it is 1%, that's the complement of the 99% specificity. That first term, that ratio, denoted by LR on the right, an abbreviation for likelihood ratio, that's 99, a factor of 99. What it tells us is that if a patient really does have the disease, it's 99 times more likely that the test will come back positive compared to the probability the test will come back positive if the patient doesn't have the disease. But suppose this is a rare disease and the Prevalence is, let's say, one in a thousand. If you do the calculation on the right by taking the likelihood ratio factor of 99 and multiplying by what's essentially one in a thousand, or more precisely one over 999, you could see that the result of this arithmetic is about one tenth. In other words, I would be very willing to bet nine to one odds against the patient actually having the disease. In other words, roughly nine out of 10 of the patients who have positives are false positives. If this is a well-known phenomenon in clinical practice in the realm of screening or diagnostic testing, why are we so uh, 
willing to fall into the logical trap when we get a p-value less than 0.05. There's a second logical fallacy. Let's have a little fun now. The fallacy states that a correct logical syllogism stays approximately true if we stick the word probably wherever needed. So here's an example. This appears in Jack Cohn's The World is Round, P less than 0.05. A syllogism has three parts, a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. Major premise, if a person is a Martian, then he is not a member of Congress. All political jokes aside, <laughs> um, I think most people might uh, agree to accept that major premise. Now we have a fact. The minor premise is that here's a person in front of us. This person is a member of Congress. And our conclusion is, therefore, he is not a Martian. Fair enough. The logic is correct, and we come to a sensible conclusion. Next example. Let's just replace the word Martian with an American. If a person is an American, then he is not a member of Congress. Well, there, there's something strange about that, eh? But let's continue. Same minor premise, this person is a member of Congress. Therefore, he is not an American. Well, what's wrong? What's wrong? I tell you, the logic of this syllogism is impeccable. It's correct logic. The problem is the major premise is false. It is not true that if a person is an American, then he is not a member of Congress. So when you have a false premise, of course, the conclusion is not reliable. But here's the question. Can we fix the major premise by sticking the word probably in front? So here we go. If a person is an American, then he is probably not a member of Congress. Right? That, that's right. Most Americans are not members of Congress. So we have, we have uh, saved, salvaged, rescued the major premise. We can accept that as a true premise. Again, this person is a member of Congress. Therefore, we conclude he is probably not an American. Once again, all political jokes to one side. There's something wrong here. Well, this time, it's not the major premise. It's the logic. When you stick the word probably in front of statements of absolute truth or falsity, it doesn't necessarily follow the syllogistic conclusion. The problem is that last example is exactly the fallacy we commit when we test hypotheses and conclude that when P is less than 0.05, therefore the null hypothesis must be false. You see, the syllogism says if the null hypothesis is true, then this result, meaning statistically significant, would probably not occur. That's a correct statement. That's what we mean when P is less than 0.05. But the result just occurred. I got P less than 0.05. Therefore, the null hypothesis is probably not true. False. And even worse, if we conclude, I conclude my alternate scientific theory must be true, that's even a sillier conclusion. So, uh, we need to fix what's rotten in Denmark here. The third principle says scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. Uh, doing so completely ignores any more nuanced assessment of whether a significant result is a type 1 error, an error of commission, a statement of significance when the null hypothesis is actually true, or the opposite, whether an insignificant result is a type two error, meaning an error of omission, meaning the theory is actually true, but in this particular experiment, it happened not to be supported. So those of us who say, look, I'm writing my paper, statistician, please 
give me the p-values. You throw away all the p-values bigger than 0.05. You keep all the p-values that are less than 0.05. That's your conclusion. There's a logical fallacy that you're committing, especially if you then believe that just because p is less than 0.05, therefore, dot, dot, dot. Going back to the testing or diagnostic paradigm, I ask you clinicians, do you ever base a diagnosis on a single test without doing any other consideration? Don't raise your hand if your answer is yes, but <laughs> uh, I strongly advise against it. The fourth uh, principle I won't say anything about. I think it's self-evident. Proper inference requires full reporting and transparency and honesty. Number five, a p-value or a statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. We all know that with a large enough sample size, even tiny effects, clinically meaningless differences can be highly significant. And conversely, with inadequate sample size, poorly planned or designed studies, even truly wonderful benefits to humanity can appear not significant. So again, I won't belabor this point, but the recipe, the prescription here is that p-value should always be accompanied by point estimates indicating the size of the effect under study, together with a confidence interval or some other assessment of the uncertainty and the reliability or the lack of reliability of the effect. And the good scientists amongst us will always think about the mechanism generating the alternative hypothesis, which the p-value is very fond of sweeping under the rug. Um, again, I, I don't want to be seen as uh, poo-pooing the p-value. Indeed, confidence intervals are based upon the p-value. Uh, so there's nothing inherently flawed about the p-value as a guide to inference. It's the, the mistakes we, we make after that. The distinction between what we get in a confidence interval as opposed to the test of the nil hypothesis is that the confidence interval entertains an infinitude of possible other states of true nature not just the null hypothesis. Um, the definition of a 95% confidence interval is it consists of all the possible true parameter values or effects that we're interested in that would not be rejected if you tested them and did not reject the null hypothesis that this point inside the confidence interval could be the truth. So to repeat, confidence interval comprises all possible true parameter values that are not rejectable if you adopted them as a point null hypothesis and you fail to reject them. Now, uh, I'd like to come to the interesting part of the principle. The last principle is by itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. Here's another example. Before you stands a very large box containing balls numbered from x equal one up to x equals n. The labels on the ball we'll call the label x. The null hypothesis is that there are 100 balls in the box, and the alternative hypothesis is there are 1,000. Balls, maybe one to a thousand. Now you can't see in the box, that would be cheating. You're only allowed to pick one ball and look at its number X. Okay? Now you may very well reason that under the null hypothesis, if the box has 100 balls, the number of the ball you pick will have some average number, you know, or around 50, 50.5 or whatever. And that the larger the values of x, the more evidence against the null hypothesis there would be. Furthermore, let's assume that you have a strong hunch, you're the scientist, 
you, your hunch is that the box actually has a thousand balls in it, not a hundred. And you'd be willing to uh, put your money where your hunch is and uh, give somebody fair odds of four to one that the box actually does have a thousand balls, not a hundred. Okay? So now you reach in, you pull out the ball, mark X equal 100. That's your experimental result. Under the null hypothesis, the probability of this extreme an outcome, so far away from the average of 50.5, uh, is one in 100. So you say the p-value is 0.01. Correct. You also say this is strong evidence against the null hypothesis. Uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That p-value that we just calculated didn't pay any attention to the likelihood of drawing ball number 100 under the alternative hypothesis. Are you really so sure that the weight of evidence is against the null? Under the alternative hypothesis, you draw any ball, the probability of any one given ball is one in a thousand. Under the null hypothesis, it's one in a hundred. In other words, the evidence is actually fairly strong against the alternate hypothesis and in favor of the null notwithstanding p less than 0.01 or equal 0.01. Now, to be clear, if the ball number had been 101 or 500 or 999, the evidence would have been overwhelming because we know the alternate hypothesis must have been true if we get a number greater than 100. But we got 100, and you know, it's 10 times more likely to pick that number under the null hypothesis than under the alternative. So this is actually moderate to strong evidence against the alternative hypothesis and in favor of the null. Surprising, right? This is why we say that the p-value is a flawed measure of weight of evidence. And the flaw is because it's only considering one hypothesis. In terms of betting odds, if I got 100, I'd be willing to bet you five to two in favor that there would be 100 balls in the box, not 1,000. So proper assessment of the weight of evidence in favor of a hypothesis must be considered relative to other hypotheses. You can't just consider a null hypothesis and talk about the weight of evidence. This formula for the likelihood ratio that we saw before applies here as well. And in the example, the likelihood ratio is one-tenth because x equal to 100 under the alternate hypothesis is only one-tenth that under the null. Now, because before looking at the ball in the box, we were willing to give four to one odds, you multiply the prior odds of four to one by the likelihood ratio of one tenth, and the odds after seeing the ball is two to five, or in other words, five to two odds in favor of 100 balls, not a thousand. So, Calibrating the weight of evidence from the p-value is, is tricky business, but the one takeaway message is that in typical well-designed experiments in large samples, if the result is exactly p equal 0.05, this actually corresponds in many, many cases to a likelihood ratio of almost seven, about 6.8. Turns out to be <coughs> e to the power 1.96 squared over two. That's where 6.8 comes from. And that is considered not strong evidence. It's actually considered between weak and moderate in a certain uh, plausible adjectival scale of weight of evidence. On the other hand, if you demand a likelihood ratio weight of evidence of 20, 
the probability that we will be misled in believing that the uh, alternate hypothesis is true is very small, less than 1% in the same typical large sample asymptotically normal situation. So this is advice to the wise that says, you know, if your goal, holy grail is P less than 0.05, uh, and you get P equal 0.05, that is not strong evidence against the norm. At best, it's only moderate. If I want to be correct in my scientific conclusions and base policy decisions on it, I want a greater weight of evidence. So to conclude, a p-value should be the start of an investigation, not the end of it. Null hypothesis significance testing is sterile unless it is accompanied by estimates of effect based on some reasonable scientific theory of what might cause such effects, if not the null, together with an honest assessment of variability, uncertainty, error, bias, and reliability, rep reproducibility of the experiment, or the lack thereof. Reproducibility or reliability is so important. You know, it, I know everybody knows this, but one of the bedrock foundations of the scientific method is replication, right? If you cannot reproduce an experiment, that is not a scientific result. And uh, being able to reproduce it, to know what experiment you've actually done, in the sense that other people could do the same experiment and get whatever results they will, is, you know, cannot be overemphasized. P-values answer one question, how likely is it to observe such data, assuming the null hypothesis is true? But here's a list of other really important questions. How large an effect do I have and how reliable is it? So that's where estimates and standard errors and sources of bias, systematic or random, come into play. What is the strength of evidence in favor of or against the null hypothesis vis-a-vis -vis a scientific alternative? So here we want to use the likelihood ratio, not the p-value. What should I believe about the truth of my theory? The number one question I get asked as a statistician is, after we calculate the p-value, so, so should I, is my theory correct? What's the probability my theory is true? Well, that is the Bayesian question. That is the betting odds question. And I'm happy to have that conversation with you, but we need to use the likely ratio and some other uh, information. For exactly the same reason that reasonable scientists can look at the same set of data and come to diametrically opposite conclusions is because some people are skeptics and some people are pre-believers. And that is the prior odds that affects the posterior odds on whether the theory is true. What should I do next? Okay, what action should I take? What policy should we set in motion? This is an area of decision theory that, again, the p-value just is silent about. At that point, I want to thank you very much.